1965, Elektra Records released an LP called Negro Folklore from Texas State Prisons. The album featured work songs, blues, spirituals, preachings, and toasts, all recorded by the American folklorist and ethnographer Bruce Jackson. The African-American men whose voices appear on the record were serving time, doing hard labor on prison farms, many of which in a former life were family-owned plantations worked by slaves. This album is the foundation of a play being mounted by the Wooster Group at St. Anne's Warehouse. The B-side opens on March 1st, and to tell us more, we're joined by director Kate Balk. Welcome to Woman 2 BK. Thank you. And also Eric Berryman, who is the main performer and the one who conceived of the project. Thanks so much for joining us, Eric. Thank you for having us. So maybe we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about this record, how you cross paths with it, and what's on it? Yeah, so I was uh, working on a project um, some years ago, and through the process of an artist through research, I had was amassing some music and, and things, and I was collecting a lot of work song music, and this was a piece of music, I, or an album I collected, just a part of that research, and I, you know, along with some other recordings uh, by the Lomaxes and things of that nature, and then just kind of had it and, and fell in love with this music while, while working on uh, a separate uh, piece, um, nothing like this. Um, and uh, I went and saw a show uh, that the Wooster Group was doing. I had never seen a show they had done before, and I went and saw a show um, that they did uh, uh, called Early Shaker Spirituals, uh, where they took a record and they brought it to life. And yeah, I had a light bulb after I saw the show. And um, I, through some weird, interesting, organic means, run into this woman here <laughs> and elevator pitch her this idea. And she says, we need to get together and, and discuss this. And uh, when, when we said, well, what, what album should we use? I said, well, I, 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 there's one I have in particular that, that really has been you know, stick. You know, staying with me, and it's really quite interesting. Um, so this, what's great about this album is that it's not 14 or 15 tracks of just work songs. Which is what's interesting about it now, and was then when it was released, is that it featured a whole slew of other things that uh, Bruce Jackson recorded and, and realized these men also had, uh, were developing, were creating, were keeping alive such things as toasts, which are these uh, urban narrative folk. Uh, uh, poems, um, uh, rhyming couplet folk poems, um, these interesting uh, uh, spirituals that, that 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 they would you know mix and 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 uh, uh, reconfigure, um, and then also just kind of different musings that they would do with each other, as well as work songs. And then with even within the work song, there are different types of work songs that Bruce records. So not just a bunch of men calling and responding to each other, but some of them solo work songs, a song one might sing while they're uh, uh, picking cotton or or, or or chopping sugar cane um, so we just really fell in love with um, the uh, uh, just the album in and of itself and the variety of uh, materials um, and work songs that were on it and the album was released in 65 and to my ears it sounds like there's sort of a mashup of more contemporary pieces uh, like there's one that seems to reference the assassination of Kennedy mm. um, but also songs that seem to date from slavery is mm. that is that accurate very accurate because you know for much of this you know much of any folk uh, culture or music and art uh, m many things aren't written down so you know a guy might be singing a line that's being been sung since the 1930s but because he's living in 1964 or 1965 he the next line he might you know make up something or because he forgot what the line that he was supposed to sing after the 30s line was he creates something that speaks to his time now and suddenly that becomes solidified uh, 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 in 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 the song so there's this wonderful you know mashup of things which I think is you know inherent Apparently in uh, uh, folk music, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's this living art form that yeah. now you guys have also put your own stamp on. Oh, right. I mean, that's. Uh, I always learn something when we come into these situations, and because um, we usually just get right to work. And the Worcester Group has a long tradition, and we've been working together for over forty years. And a lot of our technique or methodology is based on uh, the idea of recreation, reenactment, and uh, using technology to uh, channel something from the past. You know, we go into the 
echo chamber and the halls of the past to, to inform what we're doing. But this idea of uh, using the technology, um, the in-ear receivers, and to the video uh, television screens to impulse off of, it's a way of uh, not interpreting. I mean, it's funny. The piece is called The B-Side, Negro Folklore from Texas State Prisons, a record album interpretation, as the early Shaker Spirituals full title is a record album interpretation. That a, a record could be the organizing principle for a performance. Uh, there's no theatrical text, but the way this particular album is, is curated, there is a story that accrues, especially with... Um, the uh, supplementary material from Wake Up Dead Man, Hard Labor and Southern Blues, the book that Bruce Jackson, the compendium that came out with the album. And uh, so it's a, we're always asking ourselves, you know, what can theater be? What can it do? And uh, this does tell a story, but it tells it in a new way where we're not there's no fiction. We're not pretending to be anybody from the material, but there's the frisson between all of us gathered in the room and uh, Eric and the two other men, Philip Moore, Jasper Magruder, and who they are and what their beings radiate mm -hmm. and how this material transmits through them. They're the instruments. They're, it's like the survivor and the translator that... Um, we're using the present and, and invoking. I mean, what is theater except for the invoking of ghosts at its very pr most primal? I want to come back to the staging in just a little bit, but let's back up for a second, Kate, um, because we've talked about early Shaker spirituals, um, which was another record album interpretation, but that's not the first time the Wooster Group has used a record as a source material. So um, you performed in, in Hula, is that right, in the 80s, which also took a, a record? Yeah, as the original was, text, is yeah. that right? So how do you decide what record will make a good source even, material? Even beyond that, I mean, uh, when we were when I first started working with the group in 79, 80, that's what we had. We had the record player and the record albums. And we're working on a new piece now called uh, Since I Can Remember, based on archival material from a very, very early Worcester Group piece called Nay at School which was Spalding Gray and Elizabeth LeCompte's, uh, one of their collaborations. And there are many record players. Uh, the front table that the performers sit at actually has three record players, but Spalding is um, talking about the cocktail party and using a record. And um, also a record of Alec Guinness and a record, uh, a, whole, a whole collection, a satchel full of records. And from this emanates his personal monologue and his relationship to um, his upbringing, to radio, to uh, his imagination and his history, especially his uh, mother's history with uh, mental illness and, and suicide. This play opens with, Eric, you, you telling the story about how you and Kate met yeah. and about how you pitched her this show. Yeah. Is that... Is that true? And, and Kate, what was your, what were your initial thoughts when this person approached you and was like, I've got an idea for a show? Well, it was more like I have, he said, I want to do the same thing that I saw. There was something about the form from early Shaker Spirituals, a record album interpretation. I think Eric responded, he saw form and he saw form that he responded to innately as somebody who had a deep love for a particular tradition. So I feel like he provided, it was the perfect uh, matchup with form and content. He had this content and we had this form and it was a perfect meeting. And I mean, Eric, what was it about the form that struck you as the way that you wanted to bring this record to a larger audience? Well, I just really appreciated that for that hour that I saw what I saw I, uh, I was asked to pay attention to this specific uh, music in a way. Um, I wasn't told what to think about it, 
but I was just allowed and um, brought there to sit and listen to this music. And I, my, one of my light bulbs was I would love for people to be able to sit with uh, music um, from my people in this way, a certain type of music from my people in this way. And I don't want to tell you what to think or how to feel about it, but I just want to provide a place to, for you to be able to listen to it in a really kind of pure, uh, unsaturated way, uh, similar to what I experienced in the Shaker album. Um, and as far as the beginning of, of how the show opens and the story I tell, I don't want to say, for those that haven't seen it, exactly how the meeting happened, because I think it's cool to kind of hear it for the first time. But um, for a while, we, we didn't, you know, we had various iterations of the beginning and how we begin the show. And I think in all anything, you, you're writing or movies or theater, we're always asking, how do we begin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, mm -hmm. how, how do we be, how do we start this off? Right. That, that's the initial yeah. covenant you strike with the audience and is what's the tone do you set? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there were various beginnings that we had, you know, where we just kind of went right into the information as far as this is what we're going to be doing. And this is what this album is. And and then we were uh so whenever people asked us, which they always ask us since the inception, how did you guys meet? This seems really bizarre, you know, like, I don't know. So how did you guys meet? And, you know, we'd say, well, who wants to t tell it this time? You know, or when people hear about it, they go, that's incredible. And then they start telling it. Or my partner, she's always like, you've got to hear this story. It's the most New York story you've ever heard about how, about how they meet, <laughs> about how they met. You will, it only in New York does this happen. We were at a press conference in, in Seoul. And someone asked us, you know, well, how did you guys meet? And I said, okay, well, here we go again. I got to, in each way, I, I, you know, obviously I probably tell it a little differently as far as, you know, different wordings or nouns or whatever. And so, but unbeknownst to me, she well, was. I heard him start to tell the story. And I think it was because we weren't in New York. We were in uh, Seoul, South Korea. He started to tell the story and just like it, the tone was so great. I just grabbed my iPhone and started recording him. And then we transcribed the story like that. It was just great. Mm -hmm. His tone was perfect. Mm -hmm. He was telling it in a, uh, a specific yet a general enough way that I thought it could appeal to anybody. And, and yeah. I, I just, so we transcribed that, and that's the beginning. So that version became my text I for see. how, I and see. she says, I think we should begin like this, you know. and. When she told me the idea, I was just like, I'm so happy that I'm working with you guys. <laughs> I just, I just, I was like, oh, I, I love this so much, you know, or at least I do. I don't know anybody and else, it, but. It yeah. is a moment that you talk about this contract that you're striking with the audience. It feels very conversational mm. and intimate and like you are inviting someone in, mm. uh, which I think does set the tone for the rest of the show. And, and maybe let's just actually talk about what the show is because it's a little bit hard to describe to yeah. someone who hasn't seen it. So. What is the B-side? You know, in its simplest form, and I say essentially what I'm going to do in the show, but I still think some people think that it's still fiction and I'm, yeah. I'm not really doing it. Yeah. Essentially, in its basic form, uh, we take this album, uh, uh, Negro Folklore from Texas State Prisons, um, I play it on a record player, and the feed of the sound is through each of, uh, is through my ear, Jasper ear, ears, and Phil's ears. And we hear the record live as it's playing. And it's not karaoke and it's not a, a sing-along. We are trying to let these voices inhabit us in a way um, to reproduce the album um, live in the moment, you know, uh, 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 in one of Bruce, in Bruce's book, he says there are three ways to best appreciate this kind of music. He says one is to be in the place that they are made. Well, that's very hard for most of us sure. then and now. Mm -hmm. He said the second best way is to see and hear the music on a film. So you can see the actual men doing the work and, and, and singing the songs. Uh, uh, and there actually is a film uh, of, of such, a, a small film that it, to my knowledge, is the only thing that's ever existed um, that we have as far as footage. Three is to listen to an album of these men doing it. So if you can't see them, you can at least hear the actual guys doing it. Well, in a sense, we're almost um, wondering if there's a fourth way that he couldn't even think was imaginable, that we still, in a sense, 
hear the actual men, their cadence, their, you know, uh, uh, rhythms, but, uh, but through a live person that maybe that isn't them, but maybe, you know, kind of plays around with that. That transport that mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. when it's, you hear the original source, but then you hear a person being taken over by it, but staying with it and honoring it in that way to get the voices as specific as possible. And, uh, and also we have very, uh, it's very mediated sound-wise, mm -hmm. meaning speakers and microphones, and so there's a lot of um, different but subtle EQs and effects on, on the voices that uh, will give try and uh, uh, recreate the texture because each of the recordings were made, they weren't made in the field, they were made in different rooms in and around the units of the prison farm wherever Bruce could record. You should ask him more about that. It's very interesting because he didn't have a portable uh, tape recorder so he had to be near an outlet. Mm -hmm. And each, each one is recorded at a different time and place, slightly different congregations of men. So there are um, uh, different textures and different sounds to the recording. There's, there's a great duet almost where you, uh, you duet with the original recording, yeah. the whistling. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, actually, if you have a favorite song or a song that is most resonant for you. Sometimes it changes by the week my favorite song. Yeah. Um, consistently, my top two um, is the first track of Side Two, Hammer Ring. Um, I just think those guys just, I, you know, it's one of those things where, at, at, for myself personally, I will never forget the conditions in which these songs had to come about. But at the same time, I appreciate so deeply their artistry and, and appreciate their brilliance for coming up with the means to sustain their lives so that the work wouldn't kill them or the boss wouldn't kill them if they weren't working quickly enough. So at the same, so I do have a, 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 it's a, there's an interesting enjoyment that I think one can experience with this music that is not dissimilar to listening to an album of, of, of blues songs where somebody talks about, you know, my, well, my woman shot my brother and this happened, or, you know, I've, I've been locked up for, you know, there's real heartache in a lot of these songs that for blues music, we'll put on a blues record and listen to that. Yeah, you right. know, yeah, it's, right. it's tough to say my favorite song is Hammer <laughs> Ring, man. When but no, so Hammer yeah. Ring definitely is, is one one that is one of my favorite to both listen to and to uh, inhabit. And also the duet one, uh, uh, Three More Brothers. I mean, it's just a fantastic song. And the man that 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 uh, is the sole man on that song, Joseph Chinaman Johnson, uh, he was one that Bruce recorded. Uh, one of the most extensively he recorded him because uh, Chinaman had a, such a large archive of this music in his brain. Mm -hmm. He had verses upon verses and songs upon songs, uh, not only because he was one, you know, you know, had the ability and the timing, the rhythmic timing to be that good, but unfortunately he had been in prison his, most of his life. So by him being in prison for so long, he had amassed all of this music. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, here's a guy that has this Library of Congress, you know, uh, uh, size uh, uh, anthology, mm -hmm. but the reason that he has it you know, it's a weird thing to think about. So it's something that I think I'm always struggling with, even, you know, when talking about it mm -hmm. is uh, how do I not uh, sensationalize or make sure people don't get the wrong idea uh, about it. But I think that you can have that awareness and that enjoyment. Um, I mean, I have to. Otherwise, I don't think I'd make it out of bed every night, you know. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, your use of the word sensationalize it, there's no sensationalism about this piece whatsoever mm. it is an objective presentation of the songs and of the voices and that song that you mentioned the three more brothers mm. i mean it's essentially about the convict lease system <laughs> you know where we're talking about like penal slavery where men are being worked to death yes and i think it would be very easy to do a play that um 
guided the audience in a bit more of a, a directed way to yes. tell them what to think and to feel. But there's something very beautiful about the way it's presented where it's sort of like all you need yeah. is the song and, and your interpretation. Yeah. Um, it's you and two other actors, yes. Jasper and, and Phil. Phil, yep, yeah, Phil. And you take the lead on most of the songs, but mm. there's one song, um, If You See My Mother, mm. that one of the other actors takes. And I'm curious about why the decision to have another actor take that song and the significance of that song. Uh, um, well, yeah, well, it was I, just, no. <laughs> it, he was uh, spiritually the right type. Mm, mm -hmm. And uh, he... Um, Come in the cut before. If you see my mother, he does that toast as well, yes. Philip Moore. Yeah, and um, it it was just right. Mm -hmm. I can't explain. He's um, uh, older than Eric, and and you know just further along in this human life, mm -hmm. and and the song is about um, if you see my mother after I die. Um, I don't know, just different roles for different times of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting way of us kind of dialoguing with the record and seeing what the record wants to right. be. And there were things that we tried out that we realized the record was telling us we can't do that or it actually doesn't work that way. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. weird, you know. I didn't realize this. We were in Los Angeles uh, a few weeks ago and had a wonderful talk back after one of the shows. And, uh, you know, someone asked about... Um, uh, uh, you know, the work being done, and he was having a hard time kind of matching up the songs he had just heard with work, like cutting down a tree or things like that. Right. And, I, and, I, and I said, oh, I realized that maybe some people have a preconceived notion about what a work song is, how it sounds. Um, I had these notions when I first be, be, you know, began. You know, I think a lot of us were kind of, uh, uh, not tainted, but our only maybe I influence of a work song was maybe a Disney thing or uh, a very deep voice, baritone, Paul Robeson sounding somebody, you know, working on the railroad, blah, 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 blah. And then when you start listening to, you know, the real music, you know, one notion that is kind of uh, uh, corrected is that a lot of these work song leaders were tenors, and they sung actually quite, quite high which a lot of music people understand when I say that immediately. They go, oh, of course, if they're working outside, a tenor voice can cut through the sound of axes chopping, of wind, of, of, of birds. You can hear it. A low voice can't carry throughout a whole field, and the men won't be able to hear the guys. So I had notions that I had to correct. There's so much generalizing of history and experience and uh, oversimplification in that generalizing. And there's so many stories to tell that we, uh, in our experience with this particular collection, are we're just trying to be as specific as possible. Maybe my final question would be, has anyone come to see the show who served time on a prison farm or who had a family member serve time on a prison farm that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, if they have, I, I would love for them to reach out to me. You know, I personally would love to be able to find family members of the men on this album um, and try to contact them and just let them know what we're doing and that someone, you know, just, yeah. Um, but it's very, it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult. It's interesting to think that when uh, people uh, of color, and specifically African Americans in this country, are free, uh, we are forgotten, and they don't, they don't really um, choose to uh, take note of us that much. But when we're in bondage, we are incredibly taken care of, and incredibly numbered, and incredibly not forgotten. You know, not forgotten whatsoever. So it's very interesting to look at these old prison ledgers from the 30s and 40s and 50s and see how meticulously uh, recorded we are then. 
I mean, you know, from, you know, the tattoos to the size of the foot to to if they serve military time to how long to to so much so that if you, you know, got out, got out and came back, they scratched your old number out and put the new number in that really it became very easy to find a couple of them um, that had a, a, a kind of more interesting names. It's harder to find someone named Johnny Jackson than it is to find someone named Mac Mays. You know, and finding his death certificate in prison in the 70s, you know, and, and seeing the signature of the guy. So that be, that was a really eye-opening thing for me. And Bruce also, he said to me, he said he realized years ago that, uh, interestingly enough, the, the times that we are thought of as human beings and are um, depicted as such is when we are in bondage. Bruce brought this to my attention that he realized that on, you know, slave, runaway slave pamphlets that then we were accurately described as human beings and not as caricatures. I would personally love if people uh, that either, you know, were uh, incarcerated could you know could experience this or had family members back then but also most of these guys did not sing this music when they left prison because it was not something they wanted to remember um, it was it was it was a device used to keep going so that you wouldn't die like the guy next to you did um, while you're working out in the field or on the you know uh, uh, on the grounds. So when they left, there was no need to sing the songs. So I even wonder if family members would even know that their brother, their uncle, their great uncle, their grandfather, great grandfather was one of these men, that they would even know that what they did to even make it back out. I, I would actually wonder that if, if they would know. I mean, it's amazing that this would have been lost to history probably unless Bruce Jackson had been there. Yeah, people um, like him, yeah. Kate, will you let us know how people can see the show? Oh, sure. Um, it's at uh, the first performance is Friday, March 1st at St. Anne's Warehouse in Dumbo. And you can buy tickets online. And it runs through most of March, is that right? Six shows a week, Tuesday through Sunday. Yeah. Um, most of March. Call in. Uh, we're also on Today Ticks. Um, there's an app, Today Ticks. Uh, we're, we're on that. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, um, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's it's really a remarkable piece that you guys have put together. Thank and you. And congratulations on, on opening. Thank you. Thank you, McKenzie.